We are extremely honored to welcome Dr. Parker as our scholar for this Let's Talk About It series. Joanne. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, y'all sound invigorating. <laughs> Nobody uh, looking at your little uh, cell phone to see what the score is. <laughs> All right. I'm so glad to, uh, to have you with us uh, this afternoon to talk about uh, the Civil War. And we're talking about a war that we seem to continue to fight, evidenced by the fact that we, uh, we're here this, after, this afternoon. Uh, it's good to look out and see some people I know, some people I don't know, but by the time we finish here, I will know all of you. Uh, as a matter of fact, I look out and I see uh, Professor Earl Sanders, who taught me music at North Carolina Central University way back in 1972. He taught a lot of music to me. I don't know how much I learned. Uh, even though I have a son today who is... Uh, uh, Professor Sanders, who was the band director at the Shepherd Middle School, jazz studies major, but uh, I lived through him vicariously. <laughs> and uh, sitting beside uh, Professor Sanders is Dr. Arthur L. Sanders, who, who taught at NCCU for many, many years, and a five percent chair, taught in the English department, and so it's so good to look out and see them. It's also good to look out and see uh, one of my former students who just finished his uh, master's degree back in December. Christopher Stott uh, wrote an outstanding master's thesis on, uh, on music was uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. Exactly. So, so uh, if he's in your group, look out. <laughs> he is a talker. As a matter of fact, when he defended his master's thesis, uh, we couldn't get a word in the edgewise. <laughs> Chris, uh, we're over here. <laughs> it, was a, it was an outstanding uh, defense. And so we're very, very glad to have all of you here with us uh, as we probe into uh, the Civil War. First of all, you know, uh, before we actually get into uh, discussing the book today, discussing the Civil War, I think it's important that we understand that the Civil War didn't just happen. Uh, one of the things that uh, a master's student uh, has to do, PhD student has to do, is to have a set of what we call preliminary master's exams, PhD exams. And one of my questions for my students is to take a look at the underlying causes of the United States Civil War. I don't want to know anything about Fort Sumner. I don't want to know anything about 1861 to 1865. Talk to me about the underlying causes of the U.S. Civil War. Well, as, as it turns out, a good essay by one of my students will take the story of a civil war, the underlying causes, all the way back to the United States Constitution. Now, if you don't start at the Constitution, you can't pass. <laughs> I don't care what else you do in your essay, if the Constitution is not named, and if you don't articulate why the seeds of the Civil War were planted in the, in the framing of the U.S. Constitution in 1787, can't pass. As a matter of fact, all of us know that that document was framed between May and September 1787. But before individuals began to arrive, James Madison was there two weeks in advance of everybody else. A few southern delegates, other southern delegates, were there in advance of the May start. And the, and the reason those southern delegates were there was because they wanted to ensure, they wanted to make sure that if they were going to be a part of whatever this thing was going to be, and nobody really knew what it was going to be because they didn't really go there to draft a new constitution. And some people say that when they did what they did, they actually performed a coup d'etat. <laughs> they overthrew an existing government in a nonviolent way. Because this was not the United States Congress that wrote the U.S. Constitution. These were individuals selected by the various colonies we had five of them to leave North Carolina to be a part of that. 
three of them had more than 30 slaves. So the individuals who wrote the Constitution were all selected in the spring of 1787. So when they got there, those, uh, those two weeks in advance of the writing of the Constitution, these individuals were jockeying. They were talking with Northern the delegates about how slavery would be impacted. And if slavery were to be impacted adversely, then we don't want any part of this. Remember now, when 1783 came and the war had come to an end and the Paris Peace Treaty was written, people were standing at the crossroads about what was going to, what was this going to be? There was no such thing as the United States of America as we know it today. You had 13 sovereign, independent colonies. And they could not make treaties. There was no such thing as a tax. There was no such thing as individuals passing a tariff because you were 13 independent, sovereign colonies. So folks are standing at the crossroads in 1783, but by 1784, 1785, Thomas Jefferson comes up with this great idea about the Western lands. And they were talking about the fact that, that if we become a nation, the only way to become a strong nation is that we have to have in place a very strong economic infrastructure. You can't have a great army, a great navy, without a great economic infrastructure. So the first way to make money is to sell people land. First of all, let's convince North Carolina, let's con convince Virginia to give us those western lands. And they did. And so the first way that the new nation is able to make money is by the sale of those western lands. But, but everybody was on the same page in terms of economic infrastructure, economic infrastructure. And that eventually brings us to the framing of the U.S. Constitution. Even though the framers of the U.S. Constitution did not use the word slavery, slave, black, Negro, African-American, they nevertheless had to deal with the institution of slavery. We're talking about a population of almost four million people at that time, including 690,000 slaves, making up about 25% of the population in the U.S. We're talking about 60,000 free blacks at the same time. So they had to deal with that 690,000 black population. And don't take my word for it, open the United States Constitution, look at Article 1, Section 2, the very first article in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 2. Article 1, Section 9. Article 4, Section 2. Three articles in the Constitution that deal, deal specifically with the institution of slavery. If anyone can tell me what Article 1, 2, Article 1, Section 2 deals with, I will give you. Let's see how much money I got. <laughs> a nickel. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, well, I was going to take a guess at what it is. Yes, sure. But how much are you going to offer? <laughs> Five pennies at that. Five pennies. Um, probably the, that's the truth. Uh, the um, counting three. Five blacks as three persons for purposes of this apportionment uh, in Congress? Exactly right. You get five pennies. Wow. <laughs> wow. Known as the three fifths amendment. The three fifths clause in the Constitution. Why is that so important? I mean, the fact is, Northerners are saying we're not counting any of your slaves because what have you said? They're not human beings, <laughs> they're property. Southerners, on the other hand, are saying what? Count all of our slaves. So a compromise was reached. So if you have 100,000 people living in North Carolina, 100,000 slaves living in North Carolina, for the sake of representation, for the sake of those individuals who are going to represent North Carolina in the House of Representatives 
and what would be eventually Washington, D.C., you only count 60% or three of the five. So you have 100,000, you only count 60,000, whereas all of the northern states are having all of their people counted. And if that doesn't kind of tee you off a little bit as a southern, mm -hmm. what will? All right? The seeds, the seeds of the Civil War. Article 1, Section 9. Anybody tell me what that was? Article 1, Section 9. Try again. Is that, it was either that or the article four that prohibited Congress from um, stopping the slave trade before 1809. Are you a professor somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like history. Okay. Exactly right. We're talking about the importation of Africans. Now, remember, the Constitution doesn't specifically say, uh, spell out that these uh, people coming in from Africa, language like, those individuals who may be imported into the United States shall X, Y, and Z. So the bottom line was that Northerners were saying that we should end the slave trade. Why would Northerners want to end the slave trade? And it made use of it as much. Well, it made money though. Oh yeah. The ship owners. But it's related to Article One. Population. Uh, population. Uh, population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who want? More representation. Who wanted more representation? Who wanted more representation? Northern states. Yeah, but if you have, if you continue the slave trade with thousands and thousands of them coming in, that three, that's a part of that five form, three fifth formula, gets greater. It's greater and greater and greater. All right. On the other hand, there were some Southerners who did not want the slave trade to continue. Why would a Southerner want to halt? The slave trade. Chris? Because their inventory goes up of the slaves they already hold. Say again? The value of their inventory goes up of the slaves already held. If you were a southern that already had a lot of slaves, right? Okay. And you stop the slave trade, uh -huh. your supply of the Okay. It goes up, especially wow. since you can have them naturally uh -huh. increase it. Well, let, let, let me tell you what the argument was. The argument was that we're going to have to halt this thing because we look around and there are going to be far more of them. Uh, us. So it had to do with this fear of what they called back in those days servile insurrection. And they were happening all over the place. There was this constant fear that there indeed would be rebellions. And uh, we know that in 1791 the Haitian Revolution broke open and thousands of those Haitians and West Indians are coming into the United States. And there's this fear that they're going to uh, instill this revolutionary fervor. As a matter of fact, if you look at, at policy today regarding the folks down in the, in, the, in the West Indies coming into the United States, the policy was actually started in 1798 by a congressman from North Carolina. He introduced legislation in 1798 banning all Haitian immigration all West Indian immigration to the United States. The law passed, was signed into, the bill was uh, signed into law by a president at that time. Who was that? <coughs> James? Adams. Yes, 1799. Was there any voices saying that the slave trade was bad and evil? Was there, was, is there any record Oh yeah, you have that? I mean, you have Southerners who are saying it's bad, it's evil, it's morally wrong, yeah. Mm. On both sides, mm -hmm. Quakers, Neither, neither Arabians and others are saying that it's, that it's bad. And we have to go on because I know <laughs> we'll come back here for another lecture to deal with this if y'all want to do it. <laughs> the, third, the, the very third clause of the United States Constitution, the third clause that, that deals specifically with the slave population. If you look, okay? Maybe fugitive slave. Uh, um, authorizing fugitive slave. Exactly. The fugitive slave clause. Yeah. Article 4, Section 2. If you look at Article 4, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, you will find the extradition law, uh, the extradition clause, which says what? That if someone commits a crime 
in North Carolina and, and perhaps runs to New York, then that person can be brought back to North Carolina. Well, Pierce Butler from South Carolina said, well, look, if my slave runs away from South Carolina to Pennsylvania, is he then free? Because if he's free, we don't want to be a part of this. <laughs> Imagine if that clause were not there. You would have slaves running away in even greater numbers than they fled. Because they understood that once they got there, they would be free. So what Article 4, Section 2 does is to simply say, and it does more to really support the institution of slavery than Articles 1 and 2, and Article 1 and 9, because it says that you're a slave. You are a slave no matter where you go in this country. Right? And that's what Pierce Butler wanted. Butler and his, and his comrades said, let's just get it in there. And when we become the United States of America, we will then pass fugitive slave legislation. So the fugitive slave clause, Article 4, Section 2, fugitive slave legislation, and they didn't wait very long. 1793, there is the first fugitive slave legislation, and it was rough. If a slave fled from the north, the south to the north, and if that slave were apprehended by someone and that, those individuals gave him or her freedom, that person would have to pay a fine of $500 and or be imprisoned for one year. Now, how many of y'all walking around with $500 in your pocket right now? <laughs> Imagine what $500 was in 1793. You would multiply that today by about 23 times, and you would get its, its, its current value. Okay? The only problem with the law is that it is not rigidly enforced. We got to go on. So that great essay that was written by Chris Stott, I don't know if Chris answered that question or not, but I need to go back and take a look at his answer and see. <laughs> but if it contained the Constitution, then I think it's a great, it's a great essay but it must also contain some other information. For example, the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, the seeds, the seeds of the Civil War are there as well. And we can talk about that a little later on. I won't get bogged down in all of these. The Missouri Compromise of 1820. And what did it say? That slavery would be forbidden north of 36 degrees 30 minutes. So any territory coming in above 36, 30 minutes would be closed to slavery. But we know that's going to change mm -hmm. on down the road. But the argument here, the center of the debate in the Constitution, the center of the debate with regard to the Louisiana Purchase, the center of the debate in 1820 with the Missouri Compromise, is slavery. A few years later, 1828, Congress passed the Protective Tariff. Southerners referred to it as the Tariff of Abominations. <laughs> and that led the nation into a crisis <coughs> that resulted in John C. Calhoun resigning as Vice President of the United States. And he decided that he would, would go back to South Carolina Later, he ran for the U.S. Senate, won in the U.S. Senate, and was there until his death in 1850. But he was the champion of this sectionalism, that we have to do everything in our powers not to be absorbed by these northern Yankees. And so when you look at the nullification crisis that lasted from 1828 to 1832, that, that probably more than anything else up until that time began to really polarize Northerners and Southerners. As a matter of fact, Southerners were using the word secede as early as 1828. We will pull out of the United States. As a matter of fact, if you listen to King's speech in and, and 1963, he uses 
the, the word nullification and their lips are dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Because the folks who wanted to defy the 1954 Supreme Court decision are very similar to the folks who wanted to defy the tariff of 1828. We don't have to do that. We can pull out of the United States. We can't secede from the United States. And then as we move through the 1830s, we look at, at the Texas question that resulted in the annexation of Texas, which led to the uh, Mexican-American War that lasted from 1845 to 1847. And then we move into the Compromise of 1850. You know, polarizing Northerners and Southerners. Abolitionism, which had, had, had begun as early as the 1820s. Publications of all kinds. Folks running away to the North. All of, of these things are going on simultaneously and they are actually polarizing Northerners and Southerners. Mo most people think that you should begin with the 1850s in terms of, of those events that polarized Northerners and Southerners. Uh, and they did, without a doubt. Some historians refer to it as the blundering generation. James E. Randall, the blundering generation. But the Compromise of 1850, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, the founding of the Republican Party in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which said what? Okay, back in 1820, we did have the Missouri Compromise. But Stephen Douglas, who was in the bed with Southerners politically, <clears throat> says, look, if y'all will, look Southerners, if y'all will vote for me to have my hub, my train hub in Chicago, I will do everything in my powers to get this Kansas-Nebraska Act through. So Stephen Douglas and Southerners go to bed, politically, <coughs> and we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which in effect partially reversed the Missouri Compromise. Now slavery can exist north of the 36 degree, 30 minute parallel if a state or a territory votes to have it, called popular sovereignty. What happens the following year? Kansas, located above 36 degrees, 30 minutes. They decide they're going to have a vote to determine whether they're going to be what? Slave, Slave or free. free. And what happens? John Brown goes over with his people, and you have Southerners moving over from different parts of the South to ensure that the state becomes a free state or a slave state. It results in bleeding Kansas. 1857, what happens? We, we, we have uh, the Dred Scott decision, a U.S. Supreme Court decision. And, and right here locally at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a chemistry professor by the name of Benjamin Hedrick decided that he would support John C. Fremont, who was a Republican, the Republican candidate. Not, not only would he support Fremont, but he took a stand against the institution of slavery in a sea of Democrats. And one thing led to another. If you read, pick up the, the North Carolina Standard, a Raleigh newspaper in 1856, you will see that he used that as his platform to talk about the evils of slavery and so forth. Well, it led to his dismissal from, uh, from UNC Chapel Hill. Another North Carolinian, a man by the name of Hinton Rowan Helper, wrote a book entitled The Impending Crisis of the South. A man born in Marksville, North Carolina, worked in, in uh, Salisbury, eventually worked in, uh, he worked in, uh, in Asheville. But uh, he, he had traveled the world and found out that wherever he went and the institution of slavery existed, People were in bad shape. Free institutions, he said, were the best. And he compared the North to the South, and he tried to tell Southerners, look, 
Slavery is hurting the South. Every time somebody is educated, they have to go to the North. The best institutions are in the North. Why? It's because you have slavery. Slavery as a basic economic system does not promote anything that is of value. So if you end the institution of slavery, and what he did was to look at the 1850s census, and he saw in that census all of these ugly economic predictions for the South. That's why he called it the impending crisis of the South. Based on the 1850 census, y'all are doomed. Slaves have become inflationary. Slavery is no, no longer economically feasible. And you know, the Southerners were, were out to get him. As a matter of fact, they, they put a, uh, they banned his book. Uh, North Carolina forbade him to live, to live here. He eventually left there and went to Washington to live in New York for a while. Um, but he also, also said in the book that, that Southerners were nothing but thieves, murderers, ruffians, and robbers. In addition to that, he admonished slaves for not taking up the mantle of violence to bring the institution of slavery to an end. So you know he, you know he's looking on his back and home. <laughs> and a good reason, and it is a wonder that he was not killed. But uh, he decided at the age of 80 that he would take his own life. Committed suicide. He has some serious, some very, very serious problems with law. So locally, you know, the, the fires are burning as well. Uh, you, you probably heard about the caning of Charles Sumner by Preston Brooks of South Carolina. Charles Sumner from Massachusetts had said some very ugly things about Preston Brooks's kinfolk, and he was not there to defend himself. And when he heard about this, and then Charles Sumner is saying these ugly words on the Senate floor, and when Brooks heard about it, he decided that he would uh, try to teach him a lesson. And so Sumner was sitting at his desk, and President Brooks walked in and said, you've said some ugly and some bad things about my camp, and I will now commence to beat you. And so he took a cane, and beat the man almost to death. Uh, Charles Sumner's desk was fastened to the floor. Uh, word is that he was being beaten so badly and he did everything in his powers to get away that he actually pulled his seat from the floor that was actually nailed down or screwed no down. Uh, people were afraid. I mean, he was flinging a cane. He, he wasn't by himself. Beg pardon? I said Brooks didn't come along and he had two other comments yeah. watching his back. Yeah, sure did. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. If I start swinging a, a metal cane in here and, <laughs> and John, <laughs> John and Mr. Sanders are behind me saying, all right, go ahead. <laughs> How many of y'all are going to come up and try to help? And blood is flying everywhere. Well, 1859, all of you know about uh, John Brown and that uh, that raid on Harper's Ferry. And that, that, that could have been, you know, that which actually broke the camel's back. But in 1860, the election, the election of 1860 can be seen too as one of those underlying causes of the war. And so, we're here, 1860. North Carolina is one of those states that vacillated didn't know exactly what they wanted to do. John Ellis, who was governor of the state of North Carolina, kind of mild and meek individual, uh, by 1860 had become a pretty nasty, mean man. He decided that all the southern states, or representatives from the southern states, should actually come to North Carolina and talk about secession. So North Carolina actually is one of the first states to articulate this. Uh, in terms of a mass meeting that is eventually held down in Montgomery, Alabama in 1861. But John Ellis tries to get that done here in North Carolina, but it, it doesn't, doesn't happen. 
there were two attempts uh, by the state to secede from the Union. Finally, they were successful on May 20th, 1861. Uh, you had to have a referendum, which means that the people of the state had to vote. And eventually they voted to have this meeting. The first one failed. Uh, but on the second time, uh, it was held May 20th, 1861. They decided that uh, May 20th would be the date because they wanted to commemorate the fact that North Carolina you know, was one of those first colonies to actually declare itself independent of, uh, of the mother country. So on May 20th, 1775, the, the Mecklenburg Declaration, of course, was written. And uh, you may know that we have always said that we were first in something, first in, first in freedom. And the, eventually, your license plate had to be, <laughs> that had to be removed from your license, license plate because it couldn't, couldn't, could not be really shown in terms of primary sources that that was the case. And so we so said, we got to be first in something. So we got first in flight. And I think all of you know that's been really challenged uh, as, as well. So I don't know what we'll be first in if we have to lose that one. But, the, but uh, 1861, uh, it, was, it was off. Uh, one North Carolinian uh, Southerner, one, one slave owner said, oh, let's go ahead and get this thing over. You know, uh, we can go ahead and eat breakfast. Uh, go ahead and beat those Yankees and be back home by dinner. <laughs> well, dinner was a long time coming. As a matter of fact, uh, that plate had to be turned over for four years because the war, uh, as all of you know, started uh, in the spring of 1861. It did not end until April of 1865. All right, I'm through with this part. And now we will... Go ahead, you can go ahead. I'm sure.